When this Iroh and June comic was first announced, I'll be honest, I wasn't particularly excited or really even interested in it at all. I was like, alright, cool, another kids comic. But with the more information coming out about it, that's all changing. A few days ago, we received some preview pages for the Bounty Hunter and the Tea Brewer, and surprisingly, it seems to be heading in a much deeper and lore-driven direction than I originally thought. Typically in the past, most of these one-shot Avatar comics have been basically just for comedic relief. But it seems now that Avatar Studios is more involved in the comics, with this comic directly stating that it was made in consultation with Mike and Brian, it seems we're heading in a more serious direction for now on. Which of course I am 100% up for that, no more of this. Azula in the Spirit Temple was the last one shot before this one that focused on Azula taking her first steps in order to start her redemption arc. While this one seems to focus on June and Iroh's backstories, you wouldn't think this combination of characters could make a deep and meaningful story, but here I am pretty excited for the comic, so let's go ahead and dive into these preview pages. The first page starts off with Iroh coming across June in the middle of the night. Interesting to see June here wearing this red Fire Nation-y cape thing, even though she's from the Earth Kingdom. Iroh, of course, is really happy to see June, but she's like, hey man, I'm probably not someone you should ever be happy to see at this time of day. And June ends up attacking Iroh with her whip and she tells him, I'm about to hit the biggest payday of my career, one that'll keep me and Nyla in luxury for years to come. Straight away, I'm over here thinking, who even has that kind of money to put a bounty on Iroh? Ozai's in prison, most of the Fire Nation is now at peace with Zuko taking the throne, Iroh is generally liked in most of these places, he even lives in the Earth Kingdom, seems a bit odd but it'll make sense later. Iroh dodged her attack and grabbed the whip and he's about to win the fight but June has sleeping powder in her mouth? Uh, wonder if this is related to Nyla or something uh, as they do hint at them having a deeper connection later in the preview pages. On the next page, June is getting jumped by four Earth Kingdom soldiers. I love Iroh's little cheeky remarks here trying to manipulate June into untying him. It's funny because Iroh's feet are not tied together here. We know he can firebend out of his feet, out of his mouth. He could easily escape this if he wanted to. Luckily, none of these soldiers seem to be benders, so June has a relatively easy time taking them out, until this guy right here elbows her in the back, swinging the tides in their favor once again. But June has the Dragon of the West right here, and Iroh creates this small stream of fire that has the ability to spread at the bottom, engulfing all of the soldiers. This is honestly probably the coolest thing I've seen Iroh do in a long time. One of them says that the Earth Kingdom isn't paying them enough for all of this trouble, so they run away. But funny enough, it looks like this one right here was in the middle of tying up June, right in the middle of all of this happening. Even June looks shocked here. After the fight, June looks at Iroh and says, "You help." me out, but I still need that bounty. Do I have to knock you out again to make sure you don't try to escape? But Iroh is the chillest man alive, and he tells her he'll travel with her freely on one condition. She tells him who hired her. Honestly, it's funny how many times Iroh has found himself in a similar situation. Typically when these preview pages are released, they tend to jump around a lot. But these last three pages were in chronological order, but these next three actually seem to go back to this jumping around thing. Uh, we'll still talk about them because they are very interesting. If I'm being completely honest with you guys, June's backstory has never been interesting to me. I've never wanted to know it. I've never wanted to learn more about her. I think she's a very cool character, but she never showed up enough for me to really care. Uh, her being a bounty hunter and that being it was sufficient for me. However, I will admit, this page has piqued my interest a little bit. June is asking her parents to tell her a story, and it goes like this. Once upon a time, there was a beautiful thief who thought it was great fun to steal from the rich Earth Kingdom nobles and give it to the poor. Then her father says, ah yes, I remember her a wily adversary. Earth Kingdom nobles had grown fat with ill-gotten wealth. The thief just wanted to make things a little more equal. Once again, her father chimes in saying, and to take a little for herself. There is a couple of ways you can look at this. When I first read this, I was like, wait, are they trying to tell us June's father used to be an Earth Kingdom noble and abandon that life to go with June's mother? Or you can just look at it, he's chiming in to just add to the story. I find it really interesting that they're kind of hinting at the possibility of him being a noble even to begin with. If that's the direction they're headed with the June portion of this comic, it could 
be fun to get a peek at that. This next page seems to be a few pages after the last one. June is now telling Ira about her father and the principles that he instilled in her. They swore to never do a job for any government authority, not the Earth Kingdom, not the Fire Nation, not even the Water Tribes. They owed allegiance to no one and it's how they liked it. This part should have everyone thinking, who could possibly have the money to put a bounty on Iroh's head? If it's not any government, who could possibly afford that? Immediately, Iroh changes the topic and is like, hey June, do you have a place you call home? And June tells him that home home is just another word for being stuck in one place. It's not an Iroh story if there's no words of wisdom, so you know what Iroh has to do. At first, he agrees with her, but he also shows her the other side of the coin, telling her that yes, putting down roots can make one's life more routine, but it also brings the opportunity for developing relationships, making friends, and finding family. And then the most random lore drop of all time that no one expected just happened, Nyla is a boy? Nyla's my family, he's all I need. That, I, I, I don't even know. I don't think they ever stated in the cartoon if Nyla was a boy or girl, but in the live action, Nyla is very clearly stated to be a girl, girl, and I'm pretty sure everyone also assumed Nyla was a girl. Oh my god, could you imagine if they put this line in here of Nyla having a gender in spite of the live action giving her one? That that would be crazy. It would be crazy, but is it weird that I can imagine it happening? When this comic was first announced, no one expected it to go into this territory. But here we are. We have a panel of Iroh's Siege of Ba Sing Se, with some extremely interesting dialogue to go with it. The outer wall of the city fell. Victory was in our grasp. But instead of conquering the city, you walked away. You abandoned post, leaving your soldiers trapped behind enemy lines. I believed you were the greatest general who had ever lived. I desperately wanted to be like you. We fought for you, General Iroh, and you abandoned us. Like, wow, that, that is some deep stuff right there. That's pretty sad to read. In my opinion, this has the potential to be the most interesting thing to happen in Avatar pretty much since Korra came out. This comic is headed in the direction where we're going to be seeing the aftermath of the Siege of Ba Sing Se. This was never before explained what exactly went down in the Siege of Ba Sing Se. We know that Lu Ten died and Iroh retreated, but now this is giving us a lot more information to work with. Iroh didn't just retreat, he completely abandoned post. Not only did he cause a bunch of Earth Kingdom soldiers to die, but he also caused his own men to die by leaving them there in Ba Sing Se. There was no exit strategy, there was no retreat plan. Iroh saw Lu Ten die and left all of his men there, and that's what this comic is going to dive into. It's nice we're finally getting to see some of the darker things Iroh has done. We've always known he was a war general and has done some bad things in his past, but we never knew to what extent. I'd argue that leaving all of his men who trusted him to just die, leaving them there while he flees away and is perfectly safe, might be the worst thing he's ever done. It's pretty much universally accepted that Lu Ten's death was a thing to forge Iroh on the right path, but now it's looking like a combination of Lu Ten's death and the fact that he left all of these people to die is probably the reason he decided to change his ways and become good. This made Iroh realize that nothing good can come from war in victory or defeat. The man who put the bounty on Iroh's head is actually someone who used to be under his command during the Siege of Ba Sing Se. I'm actually really excited to read this comic when it finally drops this summer. Lu Ten's death has always been a big mystery of how it happened. I've made videos in the past speculating that maybe Ozai could have been a part of it as his original plan to take the throne as Iroh would no longer have an heir. It'd be really funny if that turned out to be true and we're definitely going to get the answer of how Lu Ten died in this comic. I'm definitely going to be covering this comic when it fully releases, so subscribe for that.